to the same obedience to the Father. No, no, you can't just say, I'm going to obey you part time and I'm going to obey God part time. No, total obedience, total submission. When a prophet and messenger comes, you have to be obedient to them and submit to their teaching they bring from God totally, not partially. That's what they're saying. Because if you read John 17, 3, later on he says, the glory that I had from you, God, I give to them so that they may be one, all one, one in us. So if having glory makes him somehow divine, the disciples will be divine. But we know that this is not the intention. So receiving glory and honor doesn't make you God. Because God doesn't receive honor and glory from anyone. He already has them. Okay? You can't give honor and power and authority to God. He has them inherently. Yeah? So anyone who ha receives them, he didn't have them in the first place. So if Jesus received honor and glory, he didn't have them in the first place. So before reception of these things, receiving of these things, he wasn't God. That's the way you should look at it. So we say, look, Christians, if you were to study properly the understanding of Christ, he was a messenger that was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not all of the children of Israel, only the ones who were lost, so that he can bring them back to the worship of one true God. And he also had another mission, because his good news was not just to establish the kingdom of God, which is to establish Sharia. Sharia means the kingdom of God, the laws of God, right? So that people can follow the laws of God, whether it's matters of um, politics, economics, and so on and so forth. Because whose law should we follow? The law that God gives us or the law man makes? God gives us because God knows what is best for us. So if God says, for example, do not eat dead meat or blood, you'd know that this God has given us a dietary law for a reason, M most likely for our own benefit, isn't it? So God gives us laws to deal with how we interact with people, how we interact with society, how we, one society interacts with another society. So in line with this, the second important message of Christ was that he was going to tell people that there was another prophet to come after him. But this has been convoluted and, and somehow misunderstood in the Christian tradition. They consider this to be a prophecy of the Holy Spirit to come. But he was saying in the existing narration that we find in the Gospel of John, he was saying, look, I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. But when I go, and if I don't go, he's not going to come. So when I go, I will send him. And when he comes, he will guide you on to the older truth. Well, why did when Muhammad come, he used the, word, the name Allah, he didn't use Yahweh? Like, sure. Because sure. Lord Abraham and Moses referred to God as Yahweh, not Allah. Think about this one. Did Christ ever, even one single time, use the word Yahweh? Himself. I haven't, I haven't analyzed the whole New yeah. Testament, um, but I might be wrong. Yeah. Do analyze it and you will find that never. The New Testament doesn't ever report Christ using the word Yahweh. And they will explain, okay, this is the Bible in the Arabic language. I don't, I don't understand. So Allah said, let there be light. There was light. So he says, look, in the beginning, God, Allah created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without any form and void. Yeah? And there was this darkness and the spirit of God roaming around over the waters. And God says, let there be light and there was light. Sounds familiar? This is Genesis 1.1. One, one. And this is the Arabic Bible using the word Allah. So Allah is not a term totally unknown in the Arabic speaking people. So Yahweh or Yihahu or Yahwaha, whatever you want to pronounce it, because no one knows how to pronounce it. Yeah. This tetragrammaton is something that is not even used by Christ. Now, we know how the Christian scholars explain this. They say, look, in the Greek language, you can't use this name because you can't pronounce that phonetically. That's why the name Jehovah was named. No, they say can't pronounce it. But you do that for every other name. Look, it says something like this. Prin Abraham Janaste Ego Emi. Before Abraham was a. Uh... Yeah, yeah. The word Abraham is not Greek. Yeah. Its name is from Hebrew. Hebrew yeah. Abraham, right? Abraham, oh, Abraham, 
This is a Hebrew term, but it's retained. But did you hear the word Yahweh in this term, in the Greek, what I've just, um, in my, you know, broken uh, no. <laughs> Greek tongue, I, I quoted, no. I don't have to say, I, have to say yeah. I am in Greek. Yeah, so the words I use, ego eimi, it yeah. simply means I am, I will be, I was, yeah. things like this. It is not a divine name. You want to turn around, yeah. if that hurts you. Okay, so I can protect myself with that. Right. So, clearly here, in the New Testament, we don't find Christ talking about Yahweh at all, not even once. So he calls him Father. And Father was a term that is used in the later Judaism period to referring to the one and only God. Okay? And when he says in the Gospel of John, I maybe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he says to Mary Magdalene, don't touch me yet. For I am, yeah, go and tell my brethren, your brethren, go and tell the brethren, that I am going to my father and your father and my God and your God. So it's clearly telling people that he has a God that he's going to. He acknowledges that he has a God. He demonstrates by worshipping this God in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says to his disciples, you wait here while I go and pray. He's not demonstrating to them how to pray. He says, you wait while I go and pray to God. So he kneels down puts his forehead on the ground and he prays to the God, his God. So Christ, if you study the New Testament text, it's quite clear, he is a worshipper of God. He's calling people to worship this God that he's worshipping. And he's telling people that I have many things to tell you, you're not ready yet, but when he comes, after I go. Because if I don't go, he will not come. He will guide you unto all the truth. Now this is quite consistent with the understanding that his message is about that he didn't come to the whole world. He says, I have only come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, only as a word of exclusion. He didn't say, I've come to the whole world. No, only to those Israelites. But he's leaving to someone to come after him who will be universal in his message. He will guide you unto all the truth. And that's what we're saying, that Christ prophesies someone who will come after him and he will be the final messenger, final prophet. And this is what we say about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his teaching, and study the Quran, you will see there is no need for another prophet and a messenger to come. All the guidance that you need to conduct your life now or for later, God has perfected His message and, and completed it. That is what the Quran is all about. And God says in the Quran that Inna nahnu nazzalna wa inna lahu that surely God, He has revealed this reminder and surely it is Him that will protect it from any corruption. He will guard it against any product, protection, uh, corruption and not server. And we know why, because there will be no other prophet and messenger to come after, to rectify any mistakes that happens in the belief system. You know how different people have brought up different belief and saying, what well, is what God said, we know. Yeah, we know how people fabricate and corrupt the message of God. It's not that the real message is corrupted, it's those transcriptions, it's paper, people are corrupting it. Yeah? So this is what happened, we say, also within the teaching of Christianity, not Christianity, of Christ, where they, they loved Him dearly so much that they elevated Him into a status which is not deserving of Him. They said first, said, look, He didn't have a physical father which is absolutely true. We believe in a virgin birth. God created Jesus from the mother of Jesus alone, without any fatherly intervention. It's a miraculous event. Like the creation of Eve is miraculous. The creation of Adam is miraculous, right? So there's no, you know, less of a miracle when we compare the creation of Eve and, 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 and Jesus. So what happened? When God sent his Christ with this message, message can get easily corrupted because people elevated him by saying, look, he has no physical father, so let's call him the son of God, as an honorific title, because there is no father biological anywhere. But what happened is, this belief then became to a point where, instead of being son of God, he became God the son. Then he became God, yeah, and started being worshipped as God. When he 
directed people to worship none but God alone. This has been the consistent message I'm of all the brothers. I don't know the exact order of the Christian beliefs. Yeah, but, but this is what we're saying, this has happened in reality. Because we know Christians loved him. Because he was a messenger of God. I mean, this is what you do. You would love your messenger more than your own life, more than the love of your family. And this is what Muslims do. When people like her, for example, and various other people, they insult and mock our Prophet Muhammad Islam day in, day out. Okay? We really feel like this is totally inappropriate, totally unjustified. We love our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, more than our own life, more than the life of our father and our mother. That's exactly what you should do when it comes to the love of a prophet and a messenger. Because they are the spokesperson of God on earth. Through them, you get the message of salvation. It's only following the message that God sent through them that you can be saved from the hellfire. So it's important that you have this love and respect and honor for all the prophets and messengers of God. So you love Jesus. Anyone, any Muslim who doesn't love Jesus and honor Jesus and respect Jesus, and they do other than that, their Islam is at stake. They, they, they're going to even <laughs> be even considered to be outside the fold of Islam. Do you know why? Because it's an article of faith that we believe in the prophets and messengers of God. And if you disbelieve in them and if you reject them, that God has, the one that God sent and mentioned them, and then, then you say things which are derogatory against them, right? That re this is what happened with, in reality. Yeah? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? For the we, don't believe, we don't believe God made his prophet and messenger to be killed like a criminal. God saved him from that event. Like God did not let the people of Noah mock, ridicule and kill him eventually, even though he's building a boat. God did not let Moses to be killed, Abraham to be killed. They underwent what we call migration. You see how Moses went from one place to the other with his community. You know how Abraham went from one place to the other. Noah went from one place to the other in his boat to save from the oppression of their people. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu likewise. Jesus likewise. The migration of Christ is from this earth to the second heaven. But he's going to come back again because he's not dead yet. He will come and die as a normal human being. Live for 40 years and he will die. So. Prophets and messengers come to tell people not that, okay, through their own death you have salvation. No, through the teaching that they bring from God is the salvation. Uh, I have one question. Yep. Why is it that not all the Jewish prophets are in the Quran? Okay. For example, I don't know if, I don't know if Isaiah is in the Quran, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, because they all made crucial prophecies about the life of Jesus. Okay. How many prophets did... Daniel? How many prophets did God send in totality? What? The Jewish prophets? No, nope. in totality. I have no idea. Right. So, do you think... First, let me tell you what the Quran says. The Quran says God does not punish a nation unless he sends a messenger warning them, telling them what to do. Do you think that's fair? Yes. Absolutely. Otherwise, God punishes you and me without telling us what to do by a prophet and a messenger. So God tells us he doesn't punish a nation unless he sends a messenger. So you know from that, that you expect a nation or a tribe should have a prophet or a messenger from God. And God also says and he confirms, he sent prophets and messengers to all nations. Bringing them together, you know that God is just. He sent prophet messengers throughout the human history to all nations and tribes. Now, there were many tribes and many nations in the past, hundreds and thousands. To disclose and give information about every one of them, it would not be a book of guidance, it would be a book of history. So God says clearly, look, he sends prophets and messengers telling them exactly this consistent message that you should worship none but God and shun and avoid the worship of false gods. Some of them he's named, others he hasn't. But the message he's telling you what exactly they contain. So God has told us that he hasn't named in the Quran, other prophets and messengers. Because if that was the case, we have a report where more than 124,000 prophets. 124,000 of prophets. Imagine naming, even naming them alone would be just this, what was the message and so on, right? So God doesn't write his books of history. He sends revelation in the book of guidance. And he can then allude to nations of the past, 
and their prophets and their significant part of their history. Why they were destroyed for their disobedience, why they were successful for their obedience and so on. What was the essential message that got tampered with me later, which is now being corrected? And what was the message that is still correct, that should be continuously to be followed? So this is what you'll see the Quran acting as a muhayminan, a guardian, a criterion, testifying of the truthfulness of the previous scriptures and falsifying the falsehood that has crept in in the previous scriptures. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you now study the Quran, you will see the Quran is saying, oh people of the book, do you not recall and remember how he dealt with this prophet X, Z? You will say, yeah. So it talks about Prophet Moses, Prophet Noah, Prophet Abraham, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon them all, to bring you back of your inherited tradition as a faith in Christianity or Judaism, for example. To, to, to argue with you and say, look, they were all sent to worship God. And this is where people were misled or people misunderstood what happened in history. Do you believe that Allah sent Daniel? The Quran doesn't mention Daniel. As far as, yeah, Quran doesn't mention Daniel. If you read the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, is an exact prophecy of how many years until the birth and the death of the Messiah. So, when you talk about any books in the Old Testament and the New Testament, how do you know, first of all, without presupposing their true scripture, they're indeed from God? To give you an example, Prophet Moses upon him peace is not prophesied in any of the books. Any scripture. Moses the prophet. Moses the prophet is not prophesied by anyone before him. No books mentions him as a prophecy that there will be a prophet called Moses. So how do you accept Moses as a prophet of God? You don't need a prophecy to exist beforehand, do you? Yeah? You don't need to because there is none. And you still have to believe, believe in it, and you do. So prophecy is just one of the ways to establish the veracity of a prophet and his teaching. But it's not the absolute criteria. A prophet, of course, he needs to speak, and whatever he does must come true. So when Jesus says, not this generation will pass, but you'll see the man coming in, in the clouds of heaven or something like this, right? In that generation, did that happen? It didn't happen. Yeah, he ascended to heaven. No, no. He said the Son of God will come, come back. No, he said he's going to ascend to heaven. No, no. The prophecies we're talking about is, he will, he will return. Oh, Zechariah it, chapter 12 verse 10. He will return. Did Jesus return in their lifetime? No, he has not returned yet. But that's what he said. So if a author is claiming as a prophecy, then you know that prophecy didn't come true. Because that didn't happen in that generation. He says, not this generation will pass, but you will see the Son of Man coming in the, with the angels uh, in the clouds and so on. Something along this line, I'm paraphrasing. It's a well-known statement. I know, I know. It's what yeah. I know you're yeah. So it, that didn't happen in that generation. So we have to be consistent in the way we look at prophecies. Okay. When Matthew says, for example, as was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene, we know the prophecy doesn't exist. No one called among the prophets that the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. You're right, you're right. I just, I just Googled it. So just, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't exist. So the scholars try to now reconcile how do we you know, reconcile this apparent error, right, of Matthew. Some of them will go to reinterpret, make exegesis and exegesis uh, of like, or maybe it means a branch of it, something like a netzern, no, it's find similar words and say it means this, or maybe it means lowly and so on, reinterpret. But you have scholars within the Christian tradition, well-known scholars, they'll say Matthew just made a mistake there because they don't believe in the infallibility of these writings, like, the evangelical Christians do, for example. Yeah. yeah. So this example, just one of the examples illustrating, you know, the authors of these books in this Old Testament or New Testament, for example, if they contain mistakes, how would you then say every word of it I'm going to take it as gospel truth? That is why 
when we examine a book from God, a scripture from God, you need to ask yourself, is it free from errors and contradictions? And one of the falsification tests the Quran provides of its divine origin and authenticity, it says, If it was from other than God, you would certainly find within it many discrepancies, many contradictions, many errors. So if people can demonstrate the Quran is, has at least more than one contradiction or a contradiction, then you know by that logic and by that very argument of the Quran, the Quran cannot be from God because it gives you a falsification test. Um, we are now 1440 something years after the Prophet and the Quran is still with us. If you go and study every single supposed contradiction that has been brought up from critics of Islam, whether Christians or Hindus or atheists or whoever, is there even a one example that still stands and say that still is a true contradiction? I used, used to do that before many years before here. Yeah. Used to be a favorite topic, like okay, because there was a website by the Christians. He had in it like 70 contradictions and it was increasing, right? 50, 60, 70. I said, okay, fine. Let me go through each one. Now, some of them were think, oh, looks like it. And then what I had to do is say, okay, look. On, on the superficial reading, superficial reading in the English looks like a contradiction. But when you go to the Arabic, it becomes so clear. There's no contradiction exists. So one thing I did was this particular site, without mentioning it, I don't want to publicize it, also had an Arabic mirror. The same site being translated. I said, okay, fine. Because if they're dealing with the Quran, Arabic Quran, Arabic Quran, so the contradictions they can point out in the Arabic Quran, in the Arabic site. Guess what, what I found? None of those examples, only three other different examples. How is it that you have over 70 in the English language, so-called contradictions, and there are over three there, and they're not even those three, something else. Yeah. That spoke volume to me. So, the prophecy of Nazareth doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. I'm going I'm to research it. Research it, research it. But, the Old Testament, Micah, Prophet Micah said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah said he's going to be born from a virgin. Isaiah 53 describes the suffering servant, that must, the Messiah would be wounded for our transgression. Have you read Jews for Judaism? website and the articles. What, sorry? Jews for Judaism. Jews Not Jews for Jesus. Jews for Judaism. I for the numerical force. Never heard of it. Right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna this is a site. Jewish people who are combating the Christian onslaught in their own understanding. The missionary onslaught the Christians are giving the Jewish people. They say it's the Holocaust. That's what I've heard. No, 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 it's not the Holocaust. We're talking about all the proof texts of Jesus being God or the Messiah and so on, right? Look into this, and you will find they have successful defense in almost all of them. Because it's their own scripture, and it's their own exegesis they are giving, providing. For example, the suffering servant in Isaiah, who is it referring to? When it says, oh, a son shall be given. Yeah. And, he and his shall... name shall be Almighty yeah, yeah. God. Do you know who this refers to? Do you know who this refers to? Jesus. That's what the Christians think. Who is it then? <laughs> Why don't you go, I'm not going to tell you. The context within this chapter, no, 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 it doesn't refer to Jesus. It refers to a son of an individual and it tells you his reign and so on. But the, Christ, the author of the gospel has taken it totally out of context. So when you read the context and the description of that individual, it's there within this book. So just on that issue alone, you will see how the reliability of the author is going to be at stake. That he is taken a an individual of a history who is described who is going to be and applied that to someone else like Jesus. Right. Yeah? yeah. So that will question the integrity and the honesty and the truthfulness of the, the author of the Gospels. Matthew, I gave you an example. Let me give you another example. He talks about the genealogy of Christ. And he says there are 42 generations from Abraham all the way to Jesus. Yeah. All the generations. But we know this is not correct. There were more than that. So why did he give you that information which is incorrect? I don't know. I, I no. double-checked that. Yeah, what I'm saying is, yeah, this information 
every Christian scholar, any commentary that you go to, they will agree and say, of course, there are more than other generations, the names have been omitted for a theological, symbolic reason. But when Matthew says these are all the generations, all, not part of the generations, then you know that has to be all, but that wasn't all. And we know the reason he omitted some of the names. One of the names he's omitted is called Jehovah Kim. The one God cursed and his progeny not to have anyone through them to be on the throne of David. And Matthew wants to make Jesus to sit on the throne of David. So he can't have Jehovah Kim and he omits it altogether. He makes the grandchildren the son of the grandfather by omitting the father in the middle. This is the mistake he's making. He skips it. But we know that's not... But we know, from, by going back to the Old Testament, the Old Testament text is there. So, you should question the, the, the way that you believe in a book of God. You know, how do I authenticate it? How do I know the person is trustworthy and reliable and having a good memory and man of integrity? When it comes to the Quran, not a single word is from the Prophet. He is just transmitting verbatim the words of God. The, the words of the Prophet are in the Hadith. In our Hadith, there are Hadiths which have been transmitted to us by people who didn't have a good character. And we have graded them to be unreliable, less reliable, or reliable. Something like this, right? You know, we say Sahih, Hassan, Ba'if, Maudu, which is fabricated. So hadith, any Hadith. hadith. Yeah. So because people narrate it and say, oh, I heard the Prophet said that. People said, ah, did you? Like, imagine you said that. That you heard from um, someone from 60 years ago, right, who passed away. I will say, you know, even he died 60 years ago, you know, even 60 years old. So who told you that? I heard from him. I know that, of course, you didn't hear from him. He died before you were born. So I would consider this report totally unreliable. But if you said, I heard from my teacher, who was a student of that man who died, then I say, ah, OK, the possibility of hearing that statement from that person who died increases now. It's possible. Then I will say, OK, fine. The teacher that you heard from, did he meet that individual who died 60 years ago? And did he have a good memory? Was he honest? Once we establish all of that, we can say yes. There's no reason to dis uh, uh, you know, not to believe in what he said because he's a truthful person. But what was the time period that the Quran took for it to be written, completed? The Quran was written during the lifetime of the Prophet. No, I mean, like, how, how was the duration to complete the whole thing? The Quran was revealed piece by piece over a period of 23 years. What about the Bible? Like 2000 the, the, the Bible is not such a thing. Bible is a library. That's what it means. So when, when, no, it's a library. When you had Moses, he did not have all the books before or after. He only had one revelation given to him. Yeah. But people then combine them and say, okay, this is a collection of it that we believe. Some, you don't know even who wrote them, but you believe it's from God. A book that you don't know who wrote them, to believe it's from God is a very bad leap of faith. Because that person may be a total liar and fabricator. Yeah? So you need to know where information is coming from. That's why when, for example, we unearth manuscripts of the Quran, for example, it doesn't shake the foundation of any Muslim. Why? Because it could be a student writing the Quran in his practice, and he made mistakes and he dumped it in the river or, a, or a whatever. Uh, he buried it or, you know, he burnt it and partially remained whatever. Because that's not how we rely on the Quran being transmitted to us. It's a memorization to memorization along with the transmission of the written text. So anything that's unearthed, if you haven't got a clue who wrote it, it doesn't have much value. In an academic sphere, it might have a value for academics. Of, look, this is a, you know, a treasure that we have and you study and so on, study the writing, who may have written it, what was their belief, and did it diverge from the actual, you know, canonical text of the Quran and so on. That's what you'll find. But to the Muslims, it doesn't matter if you find something which says, you know, totally something different. Why? Because even today in Sudan, if you go, for example, the students, they learn the Quran by writing it and memorizing from that writing. Imagine, when they memorize and they wrote it by, not everyone's going to do writing perfect all the time. That's why the teachers were corrected. And that piece was buried somewhere, and someone found a thousand years later. And said, look, that was the state of the Quran. You say, no, this is a student practicing his memorization skill. Yeah? So that's why the Quran, whether you call it 
the Sana manuscript that you probably have heard or here and there, we don't give much value. Why? Because our Quran came from a transmission from generation to generation. Each generation, we have communities of Muslims throughout the land, covering the whole of the Muslim land. They pass on this Quran, reading from this generation to the next generation. And this is how the Quran is transmitted, concept called mutawatir, transmission generation to next generation. So today, for example, we read the readings of the Quran, like Warsh or Hafs, two common readings. Hafs is very well known, Warsh is in Morocco and various other places, right? How is it transmitted to us? If a teacher was to give you an authority to teach what he has learned or she has learned, they have to make sure that you have memorized it exactly word for word, letter for letter. And then give you the license, what you call ijazah, to transmit this in the form of teaching others. Otherwise, you're not allowed to teach because you might be teaching something totally wrong. So you don't have the... For example, you know, um, many of us are professionals in our field. Whether we are registered opticians, registered medical doctors, pharmacists, we have a professional body where we register. Without this registration, we will not be able to practice. We may have the knowledge, but I cannot then say, let me write a prescription for you. No, I can't do that. I, it's not allowed for me. But even though I may have all that knowledge. So likewise, this registration concept was there in the transmission of this Quran, where the Quran would be like today, transmitted to someone else with this kind of authority to teach by making sure this kind of certificate is given after testing and examination by the teacher who may be a professional body in a madrasa, in a school, or a university, or a maktab, whichever might the case be, or a, 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 of a school of memorization of the Quran. How did they get this? Similarly, likewise. And if you go back in time, they eventually got this from the companions of the Prophet who taught them, and they were taught by the Prophet himself. So this is an unbroken, continuous chain of transmission and preservation of the Quran in which Muslims have no doubt. That's why Muslims don't laugh at people saying, oh, oh there are, you know, look at this um, controversy by this scholar and that scholar, Quran is not preserved. You know, they just laugh out our way. Because the way Quran is transmitted with its preservation is unique in any kind of religious scripture. Well, why the has the Quran been proven to have been some of it copied from Imr al qais the Arab poet? Now, did the you study that subject? I did. Uh, I read some of it. You read some of it. And that's that probably that one of uh, Amr al Qais's daughters, I think, was nieces, confronted the Prophet Muhammad based on the plagiarism of her father's okay. work. I don't know if um, it's true or not. I'm uh, it's not true because the historical time frame doesn't add up. Yeah. And not only that, the first mentioned by Sinclair William Sinclair Tisdall, and he actually refuted there in his appendix that he found in a lithographic edition this. Previously, for, um, books were not printed like in blocks and so on, right? In a printing press. There were lithographs and various other forms. Initially, it was handwriting, right? And then lithographic and then printing press comes in with block prints. And now you have computer prints, digital. And it's done done differently. And it tells you how these are not, you know, these are very late. So you don't have anything. You can, in fact, you cannot go and find any poem of Imrul Qais like this. It doesn't exist. Yeah? So if someone fabricates, oh, Imrul Qais wrote it this, and that piece of literature is from 300 years ago, you know this is a fake, it's a forgery. Like say, look, Shakespeare wrote this. No Shakespearean experts have ever heard of it. There is no manuscripts or written surviving literature from Shakespeare of this particular piece anywhere in the world. And now you're saying this is Shakespeare. You know someone, is trying to imitate it and, and pass it on so this is Shakespeare, yeah? So likewise, Imrul Qais, for example, didn't have those in his poetry. We know the poetry of Imrul Qais is well known. Famous poem of his. People study this in the universities, okay? So suddenly someone comes along, Imrul Qais said this, we know this is a fabrication. Sinclair Tisno, he mentions that in, in, in his book, The Original Sources of Quran, uh, Islam or Quran. Can remember exact title. 
So this is not the case. The Quran doesn't imitate anything. The only thing that we hear from the evangelical criticism is this Quran somehow has concepts similar to the Old Testament and New Testament. It talks about similar things. But what do you, but what do you expect? A God who sent Prophet to the nation of the Israelites and told them to worship God, if he tells them again in the Quran, this is what he said, that is just a reminder. It's not what we call plagiarism because it's coming from the same God. The same God is reminding you of the history, what happened before. He's saying, I revealed the Torah to them, in which was light and guidance. So if now if you find something matching with the Torah and what the Quran says, it's because what the Quran is saying, this is what he revealed there. So why is the Torah included with the Quran when you, when you buy it? Torah, this command that gave, God gave to Musa Islam, Moses the Prophet, was for them. It's not that God then sends another prophet and says, you append that in your new guidance. There is no, you know, somehow increment and appending everything. No, he sends fresh revelation and he may refer to it back and forth as he seems fit what to recall from the previous messages and their teachings. You don't have to bring everything that went on the past and so on, right? It may be that some of them were abrogated, the teaching they had, because it was relevant only for them. And God now sends new revelation relevant to today. And the Quran being the final revelation, of course, it will abrogate the laws and the regulations that went past, but it will never abrogate the consistent message of God about who He is, that there is a day of judgment, that there is heaven, that there is hell. These are not within the scope of abrogation, because that's the reality from day one to the end of the world. But in terms of how we interact with people, how, what laws in, are in place in terms of how you punish someone because of their disobedience, a criminal who kills someone, do you put them to death or you do you crucify them or you do you exchange with another individual as a, in exchange? Do you take blood money? Do you free them? This can change substantially from God and giving options. These are part of things that can abrogate, but not the message about God and about hereafter and so on. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so I can only encourage you because you are a very sincere person. I can see that from the start. Okay, so I thank you for, you know, retaining that piece of sincerity and you're inquisitive, you're learning. Carry on learning. You're a I'm not a scholar, I'm not a scholar. You don't have scholars coming here. Only a few individual comes maybe. So what we're saying is carry on learning and questioning and learn about the Quran, learn about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you find something that is not palatable to you, you know, ask the Muslims, Muslim experts, Muslim scholars, how do you explain that? And then they'll try to explain it to you. And question, can this be from God or not? Question the foundation that I explained about your book, because this is something that you inherited, right? From your parents. And God reprimands us saying, people like, oh, are you gonna follow your forefathers even though they may be wrong? So you can't just follow your forefathers. You have to know, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know with certainty that there is no God worthy of worship except Him. So this is, every individual have to make that journey. When a time comes for them, intellectual maturity, ask. Because you know how people become atheists and so on? Because they started thinking and they, when they see that it doesn't make sense that God is a trinity or God dies for you and so on. Many atheists come from a Christian background. And when they start thinking and analyzing about this belief system, it doesn't somehow cohere with their worldview that they have now come up to in terms of rationalizing the world, reasoning and reflecting. But what they are forgetting is this, they throw the baby with the bathwater. That's what they're trying to do. They throw the baby with the bathwater. Instead of saying, look, what I was born into may have been somehow corrupted, but indeed, is there a God of our cosmos? And is there a revelation that God sent throughout to guide the people? So instead of saying, I'm going to study the Quran being the final book of God, they will just say every religion is man-made. Every religion is from, you know, a product of people's environment and so on. With one brush. Yeah. So that's another misleading approach people take. So you as an individual of sincerity and integrity, truthfulness and honesty, and one who is inclusive in learning, if you are sincere, and you seek the truth, God will guide you. Our Prophet Muhammad said, whoever 
take one step to God. God takes 10 steps, I'm paraphrasing. He will take 10 steps towards him. If you go toward walking, he will come to you running. That's how God brings you the guidance. But you have to make that journey yourself. You have to be sincerely seeking. Leaving out these biases and, you know, some people say, Assalamu alaikum. Um, maybe you can give some advice to the brother here. Um, when you say, scholars, well, I can present you one here. So you can ask him if you have any questions. So what we say is this, when you are sincerely seeking, that is a precondition of receiving guidance. You have to stay away from your evil deeds. Otherwise, the guidance will not come to you. You are creating a barrier because of your misconduct, because of your things you know in your heart to be wrong. Like, you know, killing people or totally you know, doing things that you know in your heart already intuitively is wrong. If you keep on persistently doing that, your guidance from God would become somehow blocked. You created this obstacle. So God says to receive that guidance, you have to stay away from the sin, all the evil things. Be open to guidance and he will guide you. So, what's your name, sorry? Yeah, Thomas. Thomas. It's okay, it's uh, COVID-19, yeah, that's right. Thomas, yeah. um, was in a Christian background. Uh -huh. I've explained to him about Islam and how, you know, the, all the message from God has been consistent the same. Um, and he's going to research and read more uh, as, 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 he, as he will study. Yeah. Um, if you have any advice to offer to Thomas, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, how are you, Thomas? You okay? Uh, now, uh, you know, I think our, our brother Mansur has, you know, mentioned all of these things. And, uh, you know, there is nothing much to add, except just wanted to clarify something, that if each one of us understood the purpose of his it, it life, up. in this life, then there will be no problem. For example, my brother Thomas, for example, if you wanted to write and summarize, what is your objective in this life? What is the point that you are living here? What, what's, what's going to be your answer? I will have a happy life. Could have a happy life. Yeah, get married, have a job, and everything. Spacious. Uh, uh, okay, can I let me just emphasize on the point that you mentioned? All, most of the animals in the world, they have the same thing, have the same idea. Okay, to live a happy life, you know, reproduction, and that's it. Do you think this is the main aim that God has created us for? To live holy, to be holy. To be holy. To be. I would say to be beautiful to the Creator. To fulfill your duties to the one who created you. Yeah? That's basically as simple as that. And that's why Allah has mentioned this in the Quran, made it in very clear statement. Allah says, I have not created the mankind nor the jinn card except for my worship. So our aim for and our objective in this life is just only to to be to, to fulfill our duties to the creator that he has created. And God has showed us that he deserves to be worshipped. Since he has created us in a perfect world, in a perfect form, yeah, in a perfect shape. Secondly, he has sent us guidance. He has sent us prophets and messengers. One after another, all of them, they came to convey the message of God to us. And not just that, and he created us in a way that we are, by nature, then towards worshipping him, towards fulfilling our, uh, the duties of uh, his duties. So we are inclined to that. This is what called the Fitrah, the natural disposition. We are in this in this form, in this way, in this idea, in our mind, in our in back of our mind, that we should fulfill our duties to him. But the question is, I assume that we came from a Christian background. Yes. And for example, does it make sense to you, this great God, the one who created the heavens and earth, this almighty, all-powerful God, will be at one point in a form of weakness? Yes, a part of him. Part of him. Part of so part of God will be weak. The word of God came. Part of God will be weak. His word will be weak. Not become weak, become human. Which means weak. Yeah, okay, fine. So do you think that makes sense? In a way, yes. I don't understand God's plan. God is hard to understand. But God, for example, what is the purpose of him becoming weak? He came to become the final sacrifice. The final sacrifice? Yes. So he came just to be the sacrifice? He came to speak, to create the new covenant. What is the purpose of that? To what is the purpose of him becoming a sacrifice? Because the name Jesus means God saves. He came to save man from their sins. Yeah, uh, uh, my, my point is, so his sacrifice is to save us from the sins? Yes. Is he almighty? Yes. Is he all powerful? Yes, the spirit, but he's in a human flesh. One second. So if he is all poor and almighty, can he say to us, I forgive you on that trip? 
if we abide by his standards. Like, for example, he cannot say, or can he say, something like that? He can. So then why doesn't he need to die in a very cruel situation, to be killed in a way that in order just to, to save us? He could say, you know, just repent to me, like how he told, this is how he taught Moses and the, pro, and the prophets before. He just told them, repent to me and I will accept your repentance. He said it's a very clear statement. Why he will change just suddenly, will say, you know what, this didn't work, let me come, me, myself, and let this do the sacrifice. Do you think, do you think this, you know, I, I assume that you are an educated person, an intellectual person, and then, does it make sense? Seriously, inside, does it make sense? In order to fulfill the Old Testament, that's what happened. But in, in the Old Testament, people who used to be, who would used to make sense, yeah? Or whatever, they will do a sacrifice, isn't it? Yeah? yeah. That's what they say. But actually, this sacrifice, not for the sins, for the unintentional sins. It's not for the sins that they commit. The sins that they commit, they have to repent to God. That's what they do. So the sins that we commit, we repent to God, and God will accept it from us. Why does, why does God need to do the sacrifice in a state where he's able just to say to the people, repent to me and I will accept it. Obey my, my word, obey my, my, my prophet and messenger, and then I will accept it from, from you. Well, even though Jesus never claimed to be God himself. But he didn't say he was a prophet either. But he never said he's the Messiah, we believe this, but, but he never said that he is a God. How come we assume that he said it, even though, you know, we have a... We have some kind of a, a funny story. Yeah? There is a there is there is a, um, a leader and, and someone. Yeah. So what? No, sorry. There's two of them. Both of them are walking in the desert. So some of them he said, I saw something. Then the other said, he said to him, that's a goat from this place. So they came close. He said, I think it has feathers. This thing. Then the guy he said to him, no, still it's a goat. Some goats has feathers. Yeah. And then after that they get close. Then they start, you know, the, that, that bird start flying with wings. He said, look, it has wings. He said, no, some ghosts could have wings. Then when it, when it flew, the guy, the other guy, he said to him, look, it flew, it can't be a ghost. He said, no, it's a ghost even if it flew. Do you think that it makes sense? You're saying Jesus never claimed to be God, never have the attribute of God, never, in, the attribute of God is all my, can you say he's weak? That Jesus was well. God, know, God knows everything. Jesus never came to be knowing everything. So he's ignorant about certain things. So that's totally opposite and contradicts the definition of a divine. And you yet to say, no, even though he's still God. And he said, I came from, I was sent by my father, new father. He, he made it clear to the people he was sent. He was sent by his father, by, by the almighty God. He never came to, and he, he worshiped the father. He worshiped the, the creator. And you get all, with all of these evidence, you say, no, he's still God. It's exactly these two silly people in the desert. The other the person, he said, no, it's a goat. And he said, no, he's not. You understand? You understand the point? So that's why we need to open our mind and open our heart to accept the truth. To open our mind and open our heart. God's status is great. It cannot be belittled. God cannot change, you know, the, his nature. That God, 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 God is above, you know, this description to have a son and to become a human being in the flesh and to die and to, uh, to be ignorant and all of these things. And on top of that, that on the cross, what was his last words? Remember, what was his last words? His words were, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Who's forsaken whom? The Father's forsaken the Son. You know Psalm 22? Yeah. Have you read Psalm 22? Question, That's my, about the crucifixion. That's what he was quoting. My question is, who's forsaken whom? The Father's forsaken the Son. So the God forsaken himself? Yes. So God forsaken himself? The father, God the Father, forsaking God the Son. So why God the Son need to beg where he knows that he's, his duty to do that? Sorry? His duty is to be sacrificed, isn't it? Yes. Why does he now begging for against to do against that? Because he, was, he had a human nature, he was scared. The guy was getting crucified. You understand that, that it doesn't make sense, even to you. You know, it doesn't make sense. Even if you want to indicate this to a child, it doesn't make sense to anyone. What you're saying is, at the very point of where the test is, as a human, 
he fell. He's saying he's, he's, he's becoming a total disbeliever in God. Why have you forsaken me? If the flesh part of Jesus knew that his mission was to die and sacrifice his own life, and at this very moment when he's about to sacrifice, he disbelieves in God. Why have you forsaken me? It doesn't add up. That's what. Uh, uh, even the thief, the thief, which was on his side, didn't do that. The thief didn't do that. You understand? It's not my fault, my brother. I mean, that's why we say to you and to all Christians, open your mind and heart to accept the truth. Don't be just so, for example, just so, uh, 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 just only focusing on one point without you accepting the truth. You're just literally, you're seeing the truth in the front of you. You say, no, you know what, I don't want to accept because the such and such or whatever reason that you have. No, actually, you should open your heart to the truth. So God has sent prophets and messengers to do this mission. And we believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, that he's a prophet and messenger, that he came to deliver a message from God. That's why he said, I was sent. He said, I was sent. He didn't say, I came. He said, I was sent by my father, by the father, by the, by the God. So he was sent. So he was a prophet and messenger of God, was sent by the will of God. And if the father or if the, if the God didn't want to send him, he would be not sent. But from the word of God that he sent him, and even we believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in all of these things. But in the same time, we will not give him the status of a divine. He's a prophet. He walked on earth as a prophet and messenger of God. He died and he will die in the, in, before the day of judgment. He will die as a normal human being. And he was, God took him, God took him up for, for a reason that he wanted to test the people. So that's what we believe about him. He ate, he drank, he went to the toilet, that's, that's the normal, as normal human being. So we should not give him above his state. And this man, open your heart. Just um, explain to him Surah Al-Ikhlas, inshallah, go ahead. Now, what Allah said, for example, in the Quran, Allah said in the Quran, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, Allah is one, one and unique. One and unique. One unique in his nature, unique in his essence. Unique in his attribute, he is one. Allah has summoned that all the creation relies on him and he is not relying on no one. All, all what he has created relies on him to, to maintain, to survive and to sustain. All of them, they rely, they rely on him and he is relying on no one. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He doesn't beget, nor he was begotten. He doesn't have children. Because children is a perfect nature as a human being to have children but for god it doesn't it doesn't make sense because we need children in order for us to help us in our life to keep our lineage to keep our legacy to keep our name you know this doesn't work this it doesn't apply to the divine god doesn't want that doesn't need this when he created the creation he doesn't need to create them in order to be worshipped he is sufficient whether he created and whether he didn't create he's sufficient doesn't need his creation so when he created them, so he doesn't have a need to create, to become a creator. That's how, this what we mean, see. He doesn't beget nor he was begotten. There is no one similar or equal to him. So we cannot give anyone the attribute of the divine. Because he is the only one deserved to be attributed as a divine. And he is the only one deserved to be worshipped alone with no partner. This, this is the creed of Islam. Simple. And this is the way of the Prophet and Messenger since, since Noah and Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, all of them they came for that message. Worship this one God, be dutiful be beautiful to the God and follow the guidance of the Messenger. That's their mission. Simple. Does that make sense? Yeah, Tepa? So, Does it make sense to you? Yeah, so I will urge you to study, learn, understand and digest it and come back. Come back and open your heart to accept the truth. Sometimes the truth is a bit hard for us to accept it. Don't make the devil to deviate you from accepting the truth. Because that's the first the first trap of the, of the devil that wanted to make you to stay away from the truth. And making the truth hard for you to accept it. And as we go tonight, in the evening, go tonight. You know? You know, just do meditation, sit down and ask, say, oh God, you are there. I know you are listening to me, you are hearing me. Show me the truth. Show me the truth. And I seek refuge in you from the devil. Say this, I seek refuge from the devil. Let the devil stay away from me and show me the truth. 
Yeah? That's as simple as that one. I ask God, I ask Allah to guide you to the right path and make you following the truth. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we'll meet again, yeah? Thank you. Take care. Take care. Okay.